Hi, thank you so much for joining us um, this morning. Uh, and welcome to the old new Cold War, art and the intimate geopolitics of international memory. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to thank Art Basel Hong Kong and Stephanie, who just introduced us, the curator of the conversation series, for both her vision and initiative in con convening this panel and creating the space for this discussion on a critical theme that informs contemporary art production. Many artists in the fair, as Stephanie noted, and you probably noticed as well, are exploring and referencing the Cold War in their work. So today, to help us consider the significance of this, we are privileged to have with us three artists, Ming Wong, Pu Yingwei, and Li Kai Chung, whose, practice, whose practices and artworks, um, and specifically artworks, speak to the histories of the Cold War, but also the geopolitical intimacies of the contemporary. Thank you all three for being with us. So today, just a little housekeeping, today's panel will run for an hour. Uh, Ming and Kai Chung will provide us with short presentations on their works at the fair. Um, Ingwei will speak about more generally about his practice, following which I'll facilitate a discussion between us, and in the last 10 to 15 minutes, we'll take questions from you as the audience. Um, and before I hand over to the artists here for short introductions, I thought I'd lay some groundwork um, um, in relation to the topic um, for our audience here and also just for the record. Um, when we talk about the Cold War, we are actually talking about a historical period that is often, even in its periodization, defined from the regional or national perspectives we may be speaking from. But essentially, we tend to be talking about a historical period defined by one, um, the formation of the post-colonial world and our current international order, which is built on the concept of sovereign states. This order essentially phased out an imperial international order of empire and colonialism. And then on the other hand, we're also talking about period which is roughly a 45 year period from the 40s to the 1990s of an ideological and political rivalry between the then world powers of the Soviet Union and the United States. Obviously in our region, but also internationally, Chinese communism was a key concept and actor in these dynamics. This rivalry reductively split the world into binary logics of capitalism versus socialism and democracy versus communism. These binaries and the meeting of the national and international during the Cold War laid out the contours of economic relationships, politics, and the cultural production of our world today. I mean, one just has to look at the formations of modern art, canons that we teach, and you know the types of art we buy, um, the histories of even art institutions that inform and fund contemporary art today. So the Cold War continues to have a significant impact on most societies. Its idioms, its histories are still part of national rhetoric. The phrase, in fact, of the new Cold War, which is one part of the title of this panel, refers to the geopolitical tensions of our present moment of the 21st century. It points, actually, to how the writing of the Cold War is a task of the present. It uses the events and ideas of the historical period to explain, but also depending on who's speaking, right? To justify contemporary geopolitical actions, including attempts to redraw borders or reframe markets. History, in some sense, could be more, could not be more alive and vital. So, in this framework, what is the role of artists and artworks in writing the Cold War? What is so exceptional about art in the art world with its fairs, biennales, and art institutions as a, as a space to reflect upon the Cold War, to produce intelligence and speak to the geopolitical? Also, what does it mean for us to be with artworks who speak to this today in a fair in Hong Kong? So with these questions in mind, I'd like to invite Ming, actually, to kick us off with an introduction to the work that he has here, uh, Friendship First, um, Competition Second. Um, by way of an introduction um, of Ming, though I think you are so well established, it almost bears no intro, in, intro, um, introduction, Ming Wong's uh, artistic practice explores the politics of representation and how culture and identity are reproduced and circulated through rereadings of world cinema and popular culture. His recent exhibitions include the Sydney Biennale, Signals How Video Transform, um, Transformed the World at MoMA, um, the Hawaii Triennale, Seoul Media City Biennale. So thank you so much for joining us, Ming, and over to you. Thank you, Kat. Um, you speak so eloquently, if it, uh, it gives me pressure. <laughs> I'm just an artist. We express through different means. Um, 
I'll try my best. I, I see that uh, the slides are, are showing, and I'll maybe talk about two recent projects. Um, I'm showing uh, this piece in Encounters this year. It's a, it's a new piece that um, I've designed specifically for Encounters uh, with the curator, Alexi Glass. Uh, friendship first, competition second, um, referencing uh, ping pong politics, which was um, uh, an e um, uh, a period of uh, soft power being uh, co-opted in order to uh, pave the way for uh, the diplomatic, in this case, establishing the diplomatic relations between mainland China and America. Uh, uh, how this happened uh, uh, peculiarly was that the American table tennis team uh, went to Beijing to play against, to play with the uh, Chinese national team, a uh, friendly game of, uh, of table tennis. Um, uh, up till then, since the establishment of the People's Republic of China, there had been no official um, diplomatic recognition from both sides. A year later from that fateful meeting of the, the ping pong delegates, um, Richard Nixon uh, flew over to Beijing and shook hands with Chairman Mao and that was actually a very symbolic gesture that uh, got the ball rolling, in a, in a manner of speaking, uh, for official diplomatic relations to start. It's been 50 years only since that time. Remarkable to see how far away we have come from that period of genuine uh, 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 engagement, curiosity, generosity, um, uh, and just by looking through some of the um, material uh, to, through my research, I was very, very uh, um, uh, shocked to actually to, to notice the the difference in, 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 the, in the in the atmosphere in the in the in the emotional uh, engagement that, that that was present from from both sides at a time. So what what you see in, in the in the, in the sculpture, video sculpture, are uh, extracts from magazines from both America and, and China, from Time magazine and Life magazine and also Renming Hua Bao. Um, and a kind of ever scrolling, rolling through history, uh, and everything is just kind of rolling on, not really stable. Um, in a way, it's also a kind of celebration of that period of optimism. Um, and 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 re and reaching out, which I think we have lost in a big way. Uh, this is connected to uh, a, a, a current performance piece that's um, that I'm touring, and and you've seen some f pictures in the in the in the slides, which is called Raps um, no Rhapsody in Yellow. It's it's uh, two classical pianists doing a musical face um, classical music face off. Uh, with classical music from both America and mainland China. The pieces are Rhapsody in Blue, George Gershwin, 1924, uh, with the rise of uh, America's uh, uh, position, and the Yellow River Concerto, developed during the Cultural Revolution. Both pieces are kind of all co-opted by the nation states to to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, in, a, in a kind of patriotic uh, um, uh, uh, fervor, um, and the performance is a mashup of that, accompanied by uh, archival footage of uh, the the stories behind the, the two musics and how it has been used in the in the soft power between America and China. Thanks, Ming. Um, there, that actually opens up so much for discussion, but we'll, we'll wait um, after, till after we've had every presentation or um, short introduction. Um, so our next artist on this panel is Pu Ingwei, and Ying, um, Ingwei is a very accomplished um, artist, but also as a writer, having, um, having won awards for his um, art writing. He lives and works in Beijing, and his practice, which spans different media, engages with the inheritances and the visual and ideological lineages of socialist art and Chinese avant-garde art. Recently, um, he has actually, as part of his artistic process, has traveled to many countries in Africa, Europe, and Central Asia, including the Ukraine and the Balkans, some of which are sites, continue to be sites of conflict. Um, Ingwe, we look forward to your presentation of your work. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Kate, and uh, thank you, Stephen, to introduce. Uh, and uh, I, I will use my uh, native language, yeah, because I think uh, we talk about is very important and uh, very sensitive. So I try to do my more, you know, exact. So I would like to speak in Chinese. Um, I'll first um, briefly introduce from um, my um, my st study in France uh, and came back to China in 2018. And you can see all these pictures, images. Um, I implemented, um, executed some uh, art, like artistic sites in these pictures. And you can see a, a basket of um, paintings and all these series of paintings were um, created by a sort of an alphabet that I have created. And this alphabet is um, basically combines a Cyrillic, a Russian, or Ukrainian uh, alphabet. So the Cyrillic and um, English and Chinese uh, characters. So the three um, basically represent the three different kind of cultural um, sensitivities in China. So you have the Cyrillic and the Chinese that represent the socialist tradition, and the English alphabet represents the sort of position of China within the globalized world. So the Chinese alphabet, or Chinese characters also represent uh, our own tradition. So you see, I would call it the imperial typeface, so to speak. This is called the imperial type, or uh, the imperial font. So this is kind of um, my understanding of the three forms of culture that is that are prevalent in China. So, so China, the complexity, main point of complexity in China is uh, when I returned to China in 2018, within five years, I have been working on this until the pandemic started. And towards the end of um, the pandemic, I started traveling the world again uh, on a project. And you can see these pictures were taken when I um, went uh, from Poland, from Warsaw, and I took a 20 hours uh, shuttle bus to Kiev of Ukraine. And I, li I lived and worked there and uh, for, for a period of time. And and then I went to these former Soviet uh, socialist countries, so, uh, former Yugoslavian countries, all, all its constituents, parts, and I went to Kazakhstan. I went um, on a trips. And so overall, my um, creativity, my output is based on, the, um, as a Chinese um, artist from the mainland, uh, what kind of uh, complexity and uh, unique character he can give. Um, it, it is based on the very unique uh, history and political uh, circumstances of China, and also based on our the totality of uh, tradition of modern China, or early modern China, not just the social reality, but also the uh, artistic tradition. For, for example, in my art, you can see um, early modern, uh, early contemporary, the political pop, um, or even earlier um, art. Uh, read propaganda art, uh, discussions of those. So my art, my artistic output, creative output, I see it as um, a, an experimental site, a sort of a nexus that uh, connects um, social issues with um, um, the artistic development that is attendant upon the social development of contemporary China. So that's my uh, approach or creative uh, pathway um, the, um, based on the subjectivity of China itself and sort of an, a, a struggle, a strive towards um, universalness. I think, um, Ming and Ingwe, your presentations actually open up a lot for our discussion after about um, you know, what is the space of art to interrogate the soft power that is attributed to the historical legacies of aesthetics, but also to the images that circulate as part of larger um, political rhetorics. Um, and, I, and I think there's something very rich um, that will come out of that. And I think, um, Kai Chun, you're, you're, uh, I know you'll be presenting and talking about Tree of Malevolence, which is um, show, on show by Tabula Rasa. And um, I think you'll bring a very interesting 
perspective to this question as well, because you work so much with historical material. So just as a quick introduction for the audience, Kai Chung is an artist based in Hong Kong and London. Um, his artistic research engages with historiography, ideology, and affect. In recent years, he has actually received fellowships from the Harvard University Peabody Museum and from the Asian Cultural Council. His recent exhibitions include the Shaja Biennale 15 and Walking Wandering at Guangzhou Asia Culture Center. So Kai Chung, over to you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, at some point, I feel like I'm camouflaged uh, be behind the language because I, I all, always lost in language, like Mandarin, Chinese, Cantonese, and English. But um, like when the Abbaso team and also Kat asked me, like, which language would you choose for your presentation? I, and they by default, they just left you in English. But I, um, I feel more safe to, to speak in English at, because I, my English is not very good, so I can blame my language. So if I make any mistake, um, and like I believe this is my first time to to script it, like to script my my presentation, and and um, in short, my my booth uh, and installation is about intelligence activities and also agents like working between the end of Second World War and, and until the 60s, like, which is the peak of the Cold War in Hong Kong. And I believe we can open up more discussions about um, the context of Cold War in Hong Kong and Southern China, because I, I, I have to confess, I'm, I'm really not an expert about Cold War. And like, I think like, in the past 10 years, I have been engaging in researching about the coloniality uh, how like colonial, uh, the concept like concept uh, conceptualization of coloniality and turn it into apparatus like how to control people, and how to affect like emotions, um, uh, mental status like being suspended, um, in the history and also in everyday life. So my my practice is like basically try to uh, unearth and ask, and also I see myself as an a phantom, like navigating the history and also in the past and the present and maybe future. So um, this is me, I'm a phantom. Um, <laughs> the project um, presented in the, in the booth, um, at first when I came to um, know I have a chance to exhibit in the art also, I think about like what I can um, react, respond to the context of fair. Um, how fair can do, and because my, my specialty is pretty much about history and also how the, the political aspect of history and how it's being presented. So um, it, it just like summoned a, lot, a, a memory that I, have a, I had an interview with an old lady um, dated back in 2018. Uh, by the time I was working on the other project, and um, well, I came to know that the ladies' parents, they, they worked, um, um, they worked uh, underground, like, and involved in uh, intelligence activities. So, um, like, so this piece of history really struck me, and by the time I have no idea how I can interpret, how I can digest that piece of history. But uh, when time goes on, and I feel like, oh, part of that man piece of memory, it mentioned about Canton Fair. Like, maybe I give a very brief introduction about Canton Fair. Canton, which is the old name of Guangzhou, uh, the city next to Shenzhen, and also uh, Hong Kong, which is like uh, 128 kilometers away from Hong Kong. Um, Canton Fair was like after the establishment of New China after 1949, like um, when the Chinese Communist Party government regime tried to um, involved in the Korean War, but it was sanctioned by the United States and also its allies. So um, the Chinese government tried to attract more capital, like because the country wanted further developed. So tried to attract more um, capital from overseas, but it lacked of um, foreign currencies for machineries and, and also other raw materials, such as um, seeds for like planting, like planting all kinds of like plants. So um, uh, it 
they came to, uh, it came up with an idea, having a fair open up for international guests and traders. So um, Canton or Quancho, uh, due to its affinity, like geographical proximity to Hong Kong. So it, it opened up like a, a fair, the first fair, uh, but the guesses or the traders, they have to, um, during the 50s, like early 50s, like they have to go through Hong Kong in order to enter China. So um, uh, for me, like the context of fair really inspired me because um, uh, when I go back to the, the story of the old lady, because her, her family is involved in, oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, yeah, they were involved in intelligence activities, but at the same time, um, she, she watched how people, uh, traders from the other countries, and, and how they navigate, and how they um, worked and visit China in the fair. So for me, my installation is reacting to the history of fair, and also how I can present this piece of history of intelligence activities um, as a fair inside a fair. And um, maybe I can talk a little, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm very bad in timekeeping, so. No, 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 just, uh, just go with it. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I, in short, like, sorry. I, I, I try to put, um, uh, I try to incorporate um, some of the archival materials of different um, similar cases into six historical events and, and thread through the life story of the old lady's parents and also the life stories of the other agents. And um, when, you know, like, uh, because this is like a research-based project and it takes some time, but when the research goes on and <laughs> everyone knows, like, there is a new, um, new law coming up and now it's legislated uh, in Hong Kong. So um, I feel like this is like a synchronicity and the same time, um, maybe it's a good timing to open up these discussions. So, uh, sorry, thank you so much. No, 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 Kai Chun, thank you so much for sharing that context. Um, you know, I, I think when, when we talk about history, and especially when we talk about the Cold War, um, the Cold War is taken up in na national rhetoric around the world, and you know, and, and we know why this is the case, because so much of Cold War history, or the period of the Cold War is also the period of nation building. And often, um, you know, the period of nation building and the advocating for sovereignty that happened after World War II, as well as at the same time, this huge ideological battle, right? Um, or competition battle is, uh, uh, can be a problematic word for that, but it, because it took many different forms. And it unfolded in the art world. And it, as Ming, your work, Rhapsody in Yellow, points out, it also happened through music. It happened through literature. It happened through multiple forms. And one has to wonder, right, why, um, what it means to bring these histories back now and to bring these forms back now. In a way, in your paintings, um, you know, China Capital borrows from um, Coca-Cola, right? And, and you talked about in your in talking about your practice about the need to advocate for certain ways of thinking about the international and the aesthetic inheritances that come from that. So Kai Chun, thank you so much for rooting our conversation in the present and in actually such a deep project that takes personal, a very personal perspective um, from a deep research perspective um, and a personal story to sort of map out what these larger shifts also mean because we can tell big history, but we can also tell small history. And that intimacy I, um, in your practice, I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that, and I'll open it also to um, uh, Ming and Ingwei about this question of what is the role of the artist in these types of histories and, and the bringing up of these intimate moments. I mean, you choose six specific moments. You don't, so, you know, you could tell this history anyway, and you choose specifically um, the protagonist why, right? So. Could you tell us a little bit about that personal? Um, like when I, when I came to um, the awareness that like uh, how Cold War that uh, how Cold War is, and I realized most of the theory or the research about Cold War is about the, um, the oppositions between countries, and how politics came to um, in the uh, individual level. 
but I realized that like how because I I, I really interested how um, people they are being represented, like how individuals they are being represented in history, historiography, and how because I, I engage in a lot of archival research. Um, most of them, they are institutional and also national or regional archives, which um, in which like personal perspective are very often overlooked. And when I, uh, but like recently, I try to turn my methodology into more intimate and also in more interpersonal uh, methods in order to engage and connect people. And um, I'm not quite sure how the capacity of art like we. Um, to uh, react to history or history telling, but um, in my practice, I, I'm rather interested in the micro politics and how um, when I talk to uh, the animatic character's daughter, uh, wise daughter, and, and I realize that um, we try to build up a healing to the historical trauma that inherit from their parents. And I'm not saying that is the maximum capacity of art, but it, it kind of gives me an opportunity to dig into the history and also um, let my collaborators know they have the agency to have self-healing. And it sounds also like a voice to your work in some ways. Um, before I, I ask um, Ingwei about your painting here, I just wanted you to, I, you might have skipped over this, but this is, um, it's been 10 years since your first booth, since, since you first presented at Art Basel Hong Kong, and the first time was with par uh, the Parasite booth, right, in 2014. And you've added something to the installation, right, that kind of echoes yeah, yeah. or speaks to, so you also have your own personal perspective in that work, oh. as much as it is this personal story. Um, please forgive my nostalgic uh, <laughs> preference and also my sentiments. Uh, ten years ago, I that was my first time to participate, and that was the year I, I started to um, start my artistic career full, um, more devoted as a full-time artist. Um, I participate in a booth in Parasite, uh, which is on the hallway. And um, by the time I worked on a project called the History of Riots, um, because by the time there were there were a lot of like social movements going on in Hong Kong, and I I really want to know more about the history, uh, the trajectory of development of like social movement and also riots in Hong Kong. So I I spent a lot of time in archival research, and uh, one of the image which um, I reenact the history of a person being followed by an agent outside the former office or camp of special branch under MI6 in the colony day back in the 1967. So I used that image, which, which, which was like part of the series in 1914 and put it into the booth, this, like in, in the booth in this year. And, um, and I try to reflect and also associate of um, the, the concept of agents and how individual can be agents because they are also one of the ordinary people. Thank you so much, Kai Chung, for sharing that little detail of the work. Um, Ingwei, you, you also have a work here, which is um, presented at Hive, and it, it's one of your painting works. I was wondering, you know, you, know, you, you presented um, your painting to us, uh, your, your practice to us, and you talk about the references that are in your painting, the fonts and so forth. But one of the things is actually, travel and your, your personal mobility around the world as an artist from China is also very important to your practice. And it finds its way into your paintings as well because you don't think about painting, uh, please, um, I'm paraphrasing a conversation we had, but um, you, you think of painting as a conceptual gesture, as part of these larger systems. Could you tell us a little bit about what that means for you you know, presenting a work here at Art Basel in Hong Kong today. So, in fact, this is a question that has, comprises two parts. So the first question, why is why painting? And the second question is, within painting, how, how, 
how does it connect to this I peripatetic itinerary as an international artist? So first of all, painting, as, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, and of course, I, I'm a conceptual artist. I see myself as one. Uh, for painting combines thought in capital as well as uh, circularity, currency. It, it, it is a medium that has a political uh, characteristic. So for a concept, for it to be current, to be circulated, and the financial aspects or other socioeconomic aspects, uh, it, it belongs to a social structure. So at this level, I think painting is very political. Uh, at the same time, when we observe um, the total history of uh, contemporary Chinese uh, art history, the establishment within the world uh, comes hand in hand in art, art market and personal capital. So for China, a very specific art ecosystem painting comes with a very uh, unique uh, significance. So at the same time, when we talk about Chinese contemporary art, uh, actually Chinese artists happens upon contemporary Chinese. It's, it does not originate from China. In the 80s, for, for example, or earlier, a lot of Chinese artists, although they studied they studied, learned about the knowledge of Chinese artists. They were, talk, they were going through painting, oil painting. They expressed their social opinion through those mediums. So we saw a lot of early works from uh, Chinese painting. They were all uh, art. Well, they were all paintings, oil painting. But the, but their the problematic behind them were very broad based and very wide. So as a contemporary Chinese artist, to to use painting as a medium is comes with a political significance as well as social significance. In the meantime, when we mention the whole global trotting sort of um, lifestyle, if you go visit my booth, there's a painting. I, I think it's kind of a way I process information, um, uh, how the way I reflect on the world. I'm kind of, it's compressed in that, uh, Work and so for me the visual um, in art, the visual is the real pol politics in art. So when we look at early art, how it evolved, all the schools were using an artistic language to revolutionize the previous school. So in the world of art, the visual is extremely political. So and my global travels. We can talk about it later because every travel, all the all the places, the locales, um, there there are embodied thoughts about um, you know sort of a return to to my work. So when you mentioned Chinese art, Mendan Chinese artists, the identity itself or their position, it's kind of the ambivalence and of their uh, uh, of a possibility is is part of a crucial part of my identity actually the dynamic of that is is, um, is actually a crucial thing we should talk about a little bit more and also because it's personal but I guess my question about how your travel tracks even in the painting the paint uh, painting as you said is um, you know you're responding and your sense of your positionality as an artist is very, there, there's a deep historical way of thinking. You're thinking of generations, you're thinking about the history of the medium, um, specifically um, within the history of Chinese art. And what's interesting is, you know, f building from Kai Chung's comments about his work and the sort of personal perspective that even registers in the fair, your paintings carry personal registers because we were talking about how in the painting in the fair you have um, photographs from your travel covered in inside the painting. So the so the object of the painting itself also carries these moments of the personal, even as you're thinking, um, even as you're making a comment, let's say, on the deeper, longer histories, right? So, in fact, it um, concerns a point, how do we identify what is personal? How does, what is designated as public. So this is very interesting for me. When I went to school, I uh, wrote an article about journaling. Uh, and for me, journal, it 
has a very micro perspective, but in the diary, in the journal, you also describe your own relationship with the world. Or, for example, when we learn about, when we study uh, oil painting as a mainland Chinese artist living in mainland China, we're not only learning about an abstract um, technique, it comes with a socialist or realist format from Soviet Union. So uh, the, the, the itinerary is extremely, of learning is very personal. But in the process, we will encounter a, a very public uh, techniques or knowledge. And such techniques and knowledge, in fact, are also, for example, have to do, you know, what, what we talk about uh, the Cold War as background or, you know, or bigger social movements as, as, as the backdrop of our art. So. Um, my space of my work is kind of uh, vacillating between the, the sort of a mutual testimony of the public and personal. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, because I, I pick up um, two questions from Ying Wei's um, presentation. Um, you mentioned about the subjectivity, the zhu ti xing, zhong the zhu ti xing. Talk about uh, subjectivity of mainland China. Um, uh, you mentioned about the subjectivity of Chinese uh, from your uh, invention and also interpretation of different characters, um, reinterpretations. Can you t talk a little bit more about that? And also, this, my second qu question is, how do you see your embodiment in international travel in response to wh what we talk about the new Cold War? Because I remember you, you travel across the border from Poland to, to Ukraine. Uh, Inwei mentioned that uh, we talk about subjectivity. He used different uh, types and fonts and uh, letters. So I'm curious how, what, what does he mean by the subjectivity? And the second one, uh, he traveled uh, across the borders between Poland and Ukraine. So we talk about, you know, um, Cold War and so many countries we are, we are focused on. So he's the embodiment of uh, why would he uh, travel and, uh, and experience um, this whole thing. So I will answer this uh, short to keep the momentum moving. So when we talk about the subjectivity of China, just as when I talked about mainland China, the national image. So you we question or interrogate the national image uh, in a certain way, um, I emphasize the subjectivity. The, the subjectivity that I emphasize is well, is kind of connected to what stands behind me. The critical thinking uh, is kind of homogenous to that. So I'm not distinguishing between you know in in terms of artistic aesthetic uh, whether it's right or wrong. What I'm thinking today as a as a, an artist living in Beijing, China. What, who can he or she represent? Um, what kind of socio social background he or she can represent? So it's in general, we talk about the national image. It's homogenous to that. And the second point, uh, in the process of traveling, um, there are a lot of details. But overall, it is, as a Chinese artist, how to do process the former socialist countries. Um, China is a. China is a transforming social, socialist country. You can, uh, as a, from a personal perspective, to discuss these uh, former so Soviet, uh, former socialist countries. But there are also, of course, other details. We can actually ex 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 explore this a little bit deeper. Thank you. Ingwe, thank you for that very nuanced and considered um, answer, because I think this is something that we have to also appreciate, right? When we talk about the baggages of um, not the baggage, but the national frameworks that define us as individuals, even beyond as artists, these are part of an international order that comes out of, um, you know, that that is a site of uh, contestation currently as well. There are moments in which, um, and that is imprecated with economy, which is imprecated also with history. And so I think that um, being very conscientious of the legacies and inheritances that we have when we produce as artists and the spaces that we occupy um, is something that actually carries across all your works and practices. And it's a very critical one because it affects the way that we've, you know, it, it calls for a type of criticality about the type of art education we've had, 
about the type of national educations we've had growing up. And also it, it feeds in a little bit to even the panel before this about the question of the type of international art world we want to occupy as individuals and our roles and agencies, even within the art world of speaking to that. So with that very big grandiose statement as a transition, which we can unpack a little bit about more about the role of art. Ming, I wanted to, to invite you back into this conversation in a sense, because the work that you're, you're presenting um, with Friendship First, Competition Second, is part of a larger body of research that you've been developing. You mentioned um, Rhapsody in Yellow, but there's been a, um, you've had a longer engagement also with Hong Kong itself um, in, you were here on residency in Parasite Spring in 2013, 2014 that led to an expansive um, and ongoing project on Cantonese opera, cinema, um, and Chinese science fiction. I was wondering, could you speak a little bit about what it means for Friendship First for you to be presented here at Art um, Basel, but also um, maybe string together some of the research that has been unfolding for you in relation to um, China and the Cold War? Well, I started coming to Hong Kong regularly since 2010. Mm -hmm. This was before Art Basel <laughs> came. <laughs> it was still Art Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've been coming regularly uh, to research um, on what interests me, which is the, the history of moving image, mm -hmm. of cinema, mm, and in this particular case, the history of uh, early Hong Kong cinema, Cantonese opera cinema, which is uh, a very little known genre uh, in world cinema history where um, southern, where Cantonese opera troops went from Hong Kong Harbor and traveled across the Pacific to California to perform for the mainly southern Chinese, mainly male immigrants there, uh, encountered Hollywood and cinema and brought it back to China via Hong Kong and via Cantonese opera cinema. That was my, the beginning of my my uh, research uh, uh, when I came to Hong Kong. But of course, while I was here, the contemporary art market uh, became what it is. And at the same time, the, the growing unrest from uh, the, 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 the local populace here uh, as was escalating. And my research kind of uh, uh, evolved. As, as a result of uh, this historical um, uh, occurrences. And um, I, so starting from looking at the relations between um, China and America from the 20s, 30s, I, I went back in time to the 19th, to the 19th century, uh, still tracing back the roots of uh, performance histories um, to Cantonese opera uh, in the Pearl River Delta but also with a view on what's happening, what's, what is the future of Hong Kong and China. Everyone was looking. Uh, and so I got interested in what uh, notions of, of uh, science fiction, of, of the future. And I began to look at the history of uh, science fiction in the Chinese speaking world. It led on to several projects. It also led to the, um, the idea to create a, a science fiction Cantonese opera cinema project which I've been struggling to, to, um, to, to finish. Um, but I, I will be, uh, uh, probably in the next few years, uh, because I'm also including now Vancouver in, in the trajectories of the, of, of the, of the journey. Um, I, I feel a lot of kinship with, uh, uh, with, with what Kai Chung and, uh, and, and Ying Wei have, have discussed. Uh, as, as a fellow artist where we find ourselves as, uh, as collectors of narratives. I, I like the, the word uh, that Kai Chung used about being a phantom, mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh, collecting and kind of uh, activating uh, uh, these narratives. I also uh, 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 and, uh, understand the, the drive to, 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 to go on the road, to travel as interlocutors, as uh, not, not really ambassadors, but really as uh, to get first-hand first -hand accounts as a, as a cosmopolitan artist of Chinese descent uh, and to kind of engage with, uh, with, uh, with the greater world. Mm. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, 
That that's a great pivot um, for some, for a question I want to ask you, but also one that I want to ask all three of you. You know, we, we're kind of getting to this momentum in this discussion um, about the international and what the international means and what that means coming from the different perspectives, the identities ascribed onto us, the identities we carry, but also the stories that we take um, care of as we sort of do research and we uncover um, the smaller histories, right? The histories that you don't necessarily get taught in school, but the histories that you discover in the archive, that you discover through um, encounter, through, through personal connection, through the artistic research process. And with that in mind, I wanna really weave in and spend a little bit of time with what it means to be international and how inter the concept of being international in the art world is and how you've used that in your practice. And Ming, I you know, when you, when you s dropped a little reference about the question of being ambassadors or interlocutors, there's a work that you've made hand in hand, which I think is an interesting one to think about the artist's role geopolitically or even to borrow a term that is being used more um, to describe this kind of ambiguity that contemporary art or artistic production has in the international order, geopoetic. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you see, it? could you describe the Hand in Hand project and also lean more into like the possibilities that an artist, an agent, um, an artist has? Hand in Hand, uh, Solaso was a project, Sunu Japo in in uh, Senegalese, uh, was a project I did, um, when was this now, 2018, um, where I traveled to Dakar, Senegal. Um, um, I had gone there once before um, with an exhibition and was totally interested in what was happening in, uh, on a continent, and particularly, particularly in, in, in Dakar, West Africa, which was the first stop uh, for Xi Jinping's uh, initiative for the Belt and Road, and uh, was was well, I was very uh, kind of like um, uh, I don't uh, what's the I don't even know what the word was. Okay, there was a lot of um, building that was happening uh, in, in 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 Dakar, uh, thanks to the the input of uh, of capital from from China. What really struck me was the building of the. Museum of Black Civilizations uh, in Dakar, Senegal, which was actually a dream of their first, the first Senegalese president, uh, Leopold Senghor, himself a poet and visionary, who dreamed of this Museum of Black Civilizations as a symbol of post-colonial um, um, Africa. Uh, uh, unfortunately, didn't they didn't have the means to 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 realize it until literally um, uh, 2018, they built it with uh, uh, Chinese money. So I decided to go and travel to, to, to look at it. Uh, and um, I could only manage it <laughs> fundraising wise by uh, getting support from Goethe Institute. And then I also invited uh, two colleagues of mine, uh, uh, Enoch Cheng, a curator from Hong Kong, and Xia Yan Guo, a curator from Beijing. And there we were, three, uh, three Chinese boys, one from Singapore, one from Beijing, one from Hong Kong, tripsing around uh, Dakar, Senegal, and encountering face-to-face uh, -face in real life uh, Afri Africa-Chinese relations, right? In your face, uh, collecting narratives firsthand. Uh, the, the, we visited the Confucian uh, Institute where there was a, a local com Chinese speaking competition by young uh, African students. Uh, I went, we went to the Museum of Black Civilizations, but also the National Museum for Wrestling, the, the, which is a national spot for, for, for Senegal, and the, and the Grand Theater, for, all built by uh, Chinese money. And, and make no mistake, the imprint of China was, was everywhere as a sign of friendship. And so I collected um, the materials uh, from that in order to, to create a kind of visual poem uh, to, to, to reflect um, some of uh, uh, our um, encounters. And I guess in a similar way, that's what I do as an artist 
uh, coming to Hong Kong, going to southern China to, for, for research. I, I am uh, of Chinese descent, but grew up in Singapore, a very young nation where I, I, can't, cl I can't claim uh, a direct uh, uh, inheritance of any hegemonic uh, tradition. I wish I could say, like mm -hmm. I could fall back on the history of, of Chinese painting. I, mm -hmm. I can't, I did study traditional brush painting in Nanyang Academy, yeah. but that's only a really small part of me. Part of me is also uh, a result of, uh, of uh, a British colonial education. Part of me is now also German. Um, uh, and uh, becoming very aware, I think, of uh, how uh, the world sees me sees so-called us, what, what Chineseness means. Uh, it's unusual because Chineseness both denotes uh, a, 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 um, a racial identity but also a, a, a national identity. And in between, there is a whole spectrum that is very, very often overlooked. And I think that's one of the things that, I, 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 that, that uh, motivates me to, 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 to investigate uh, and, and deal with in my work. Uh, thank you, Ming. I'm, I think it becomes very clear with Hand in Hand, the type of space that you kind of create with an artist, um, artist um, an art commission, or even taking on as your artistic research, because this is something that you sort of instigated, right? Um, and, you know, I want to hold that as that space of nuance and that space of complexity that the artwork can open up beyond just the sort of experience and reflective moment that we might have in front of an artwork. Um, uh, um, Kai Chung, I wonder whether, you know, travel and mobility within the art world is also something that's important in your practice, and we haven't actually gotten to that yet. And I was wondering if you could speak about that, because there's a quite expansive project of yours called Displacement um, that is almost predicated on you being on the move since um, 2020. And I'm wondering if you have, um, in hearing Ming's um, narration of or, and frame, framing of hand in hand, um, whether you, you find resonance in that way of working or if you could talk a little bit about what travel and being part of this international fabric means in your practice. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, I, in the last few years, I work on um, a series of projects called Displacement um, because I, I try to navigate and also look into the Chinese context of displacement. Because in English, we, we all know displacement means uh, one being displaced or travel or migrate, no matter by force or voluntary to the other place. And um, they may, the people may or may not um, engage in the longing for home and try to build their home, own version of home on, in the other land. Um, but in Chinese, we, we we have a little bit of problem of translating, like because um, it's not about something being extracted and put it into other place, but also about the mental status, like how they see their own identity. Uh, they're displayed towards It's It can also be migration. The kind of like a, a multi-layered um, version of displacement. Uh, I. I have been traveling, uh, moving, <laughs> ever since the pandemics. Like when the pandemics really um, restricted global international traveling. But by the time I moved to China, mainland China, and stayed in mainland China for a few years with my partner, and and by the time China was kind of open internally, so like people, Chinese people, can travel within China in the early stage of the pandemics. But later. There were a lot of like local uh, lockdowns in the cities, and and I I'm being extracted uh, from Hong Kong, and I I, f I feel like I need to look for similar cases of people that they engaged in displacement. So that, that's why I initiate another project called uh, the Infinite Train. That I spent uh, quite a lot of time to look into the coloniality and also people being displaced in Manchuria, where is um, where is the northeast uh, of China, which is next to the Korean Peninsula and also Russia and Inner Mongolia. So um, I think that kind of uh, mobility really gave me 
um, another layer of alienation because I, I am always foreign to the local context. And, but at the same time, it gives me so much room to reflect on and also look back into Hong Kong. Like when people talk about identity of Hong Kong, whether if they're being extracted or being forced to migrate to the other city, are they Hong Kong people? Because there are quite a lot of exodogs of Hong Kong people like recently. So um, uh, I, I really embrace that kind of discussions and, and I realize that I, I can carry another perspective to look into. Um, maybe I would not put it as the identity of Hong Kong people, but subjectivity, like how we can build our own subjectivity even we are not at the same place. So um, I, yeah, thank you so much for the questions. Thanks so much, Kai Chung. Um, Ingwei, I, I know you were nodding to this question of subjectivity, and uh, so, sorry, to the statement of subjectivity, and and I know that um, you're very explicit in the travel that you have um, undertaken, and that also that your experience um, in France when you yeah. in 2015 has informed a lot of the way you think about the international world, and. Um, your place within it. Could you share a little bit more about how you? Mm. Yes. Um, a lot of today's uh, what interests me, um, the regions of conflict or international issues were uh, I encountered when I was in France. So France, one of the most chaotic period uh, after a terror attacks in France, where I used to live in France, uh, was um, has a very high concentration of Muslim French, and there was a demonstration against terror attacks. But for me, when the marching people moved to that region where I used to live, and I realized, in fact, a lot of the local residents they were French, and they were just standing by, and watched the. The, the demonstration, demonstrators passed by. So at that moment, I came to realize that a lot of the conflicts, or let's say a lot of things, were structural. They were on a very great magnitude. They were a powerful entity that penetrated into the world of art. And I also realized that back then France was um, confronted with the rise of the extreme right. My teacher was saying, uh, we are dismissed for today. All of you can go and vote because you are all adults and you should stop the rise of uh, extreme right. So in an art school, we could still um, face at first hand the political tensions of our time. So at that juncture, I started to want to understand from my own in my own way what the international or international issues are. So when uh, um, Ming, Ming Wang mentioned, you know, when it's a very mainstream a Chinese uh, national image, I realized that in contemporary Chinese society there are two uh, pathways that. You know, one is Belt and Road. That is a national level. You know, sort of a rejuvenation of the Silk Road. Sort of a lot of individualized trading. Sort of extracted to to become extrapolated into a sort of a exportable national ideology. And then the long march uh, of the Red Army as they retreated from uh, the KMT attacks. So the long march, it became a sort of a symbolic uh, spiritual icon so so the two values were constructed out of naturally originating organically developed um, you know historical events so why these two are very influential and I would like to start an own trajectory uh, for example uh, when I before I went to London I went to Shibai Po in Hebei and before I traveled to Kenya I went to Yan'an um, where the Communist Party it was of great significance to to the Communist Party right so I wanted to see that I wanted to use this artistic or let's say let's uh, jumpy in a personalized way uh, to understand I, I want to get into the Chinese, the gigantic uh, Chinese political historical narrative uh, from a personal texture. And 
to engage it critically, independently, but we also want to realize the mainstream, let's say, uh, very influential uh, narratives and ideologies are in some way why I think Kai Chong and a lot of other people, uh, perhaps even uh, what I've described as subjectivity, uh, they are skeptical about such subjectivity. For me, the subjectivity I describe is exactly uh, homo homogenous, um, mutually constitutive um, with the national image. So the whole imitation is also uh, one of my uh, approaches to art. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think each of you have actually laid out very clearly the importance of artistic subjectivity as a sort of resistance towards um, nationalistic um, frameworks that reduce identity down, right, and, and mobilize that towards other ends. And that actually, in each of your practices, even though, you know, there's such a range of material that you work with, and mediums that, that you work with, and even research projects, at the end of the day, when we start talking about the international and the art world, there's a space that each of you sort of open up with your practices and your research pro um, projects. Ones that resist um, the sort of framing of the national or the framing of the adversarial um, right off the bat. Um, and at the same time, it's so attentive to the histories that sometimes get reframed within national narratives, right? And that those complexities are kind of um, let down. I'm going to ask you one last question before opening to the floor. Um, for uh, uh, for 10 minutes. Um, and this is the one where we've talked about international, we've talked about memory, we've talked about artistic practice, memory being the personal sort of materials that you've worked with, but also the question of legacy, what is inherited. Um, and what I wanna go through is through a very technical one, which is actually about material, the actual material you're working with when you are doing research. And this is interesting because I think all three of you share um, a sort of turn to specific types of historical material. I mean, newspapers, broadsheets, historical material, all come up actually in all of your work. And I was wondering if you could just shortly, because we want to open also to um, the audience, um, if you could just talk a little bit about the process of how you find your material, you know, how you find the historical material in which your work is constructed. Oh, Kathleen. <laughs> I'm going to say that, uh, yes, I look at newspapers, archival material and all that, but it's not, the, 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 the object itself is not, for, for me, not uh, uh, important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the ping pong piece, it's very low resolution to the fact that I've even obliterated the faces. You can't tell if it's American or Chinese players. Uh, it's, it's just flipping through. But to put yourself in the shoes of people who lived at a time who went through that, or encountering this moment at a time, what was it like? How would I have felt? I come from the theater, and my, my tool is, to, is empathy. How did it feel like that? Is that something that we, that we can try to uh, reactivate? I, when I spoke of being in Senegal and looking at all these monuments, and I, I couldn't describe the feeling. Like I didn't know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Am I proud that uh, China helped them to build the dream of the president for black civilizations museums, which is a, a symbol of post-colonialism, but is this another form of, uh, we know, like it's, it's, it's complex. And I think these are the things which I, 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 I try to, to, to claim onto. Ping pong politics, was it a good thing or was it just a, 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 a smoke screen? I don't know, uh, I'm trying to find out. Thank you. Mm, do it. Um, I think in all our, all three of us's practices, we quote and reference a lot of historical image and archival work. So for me, this is very interesting. Uh, it is material, but on the other hand, as our values, our positions evolve and change, uh, all these things undergo very drastic changes as well. So one thing that struck me when I arrived in Kiev, uh, the entire state's artistic art museums and historic museums, they moved 
they closed a lot of the exhibition halls because that part of history were so closely intertwined with that of Russia. And, and they actually altered a lot of uh, structure and names of streets and, and sculptures. So when we talk about materiality or material, it is based on uh, predicated on a particular way of observing, a particular way of thinking. So that is the real material that we employ. When we uh, use this perspective to observe certain things, we realize that the Cold War, or let's say the heritage of the Cold War, um, still permeates our uh, life. Yeah, I think it's time for the Q&A, but I will <laughs> give it very short. Uh, very brief about my, my methodologies. Uh, my, because my practice is all about um, finding, unearthing the supposable lives. So um, I, I source my materials in the second-hand market like, because I, I feel like um, I got very surprised I can easily find those um, archival materials on the second-hand market. Um, for example, personal archives, uh, records about like photographs of um, selfies like date back to um, the Cold War era in China. Um, I was surprised that those valuable um, photographs, they, they are being disposed. And um, at some point I feel like art, like, I'm an artist, and I, I can um, transform those disposable being, the, fir, uh, the, fr um, the phrase disposable being framed and being phrased but I realized that they have a main value of um, bringing them to life. So um, yeah, that's why I, I use like, that kind of material a lot in this exhibition. I just want to thank all three of you for this diverse answer. I was, as Ming was rightly kind of alluding, I was being quite naughty with that <laughs> about material. Um, but I think that you know what comes out of all three of your questions is how much you know, historical material is very much alive, and it's very much based in a space in which we can build empathy, in which we can build connection, in which we can overthink things, um, overcoming um, frameworks that might be pigeonholing us in some ways. So with that in mind, I want to open to the audience to see if there's any burning questions from the audience. Um, oh, we have uh, uh, one question. Um, are there any more? Just one? Okay, the one, uh, two. We have two questions, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much for such a conversation. The conversation it was uh, momentous, I would think. And uh, I just wonder, I have a philosophical one question for all of you. Well, and for Catherine, too. Um, while we've been talking today a lot about identity and self-identity, to be precise, uh, we've talked a lot about like different nations, about different uh, you know cultural and historical contexts, and if we are trying to uh, kind of understand it and to make it seen to a bigger audience, like the other context, which is. Uh, in contrast with our, with our context, yeah? Then how should we like talk about it? And do we have a right to identify other nations' history, other nations' context, other nations' culture, and uh, stuff like that, as an artist and as a curator, for example, too? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Do you mind if we just take the second question as well? Because we're a little, I, I apologize, I realize we started. Um, the gentleman in the front, and we'll, con, we'll, con, um, we'll answer both. OK, um, I just wanted to ask, um, you are doing the research on the old items of Cold War, where it's very limited and, uh, let's say, uh, subjective. And my question is, it wouldn't be easy if you go through the same subjects with today information. There is plenty more uh, why you chose to go through the history and not with all the information and many angles that are today to express the same message. Okay, so we have two questions. And essentially, um, if you don't mind, I will paraphrase this into one for us. And one is really about the positionality of speaking to other histories that are perhaps not your own national history. And then the other question is, you know, this is very difficult 
research to undertake as a historian, let alone as an artist, and there are freedoms um, that artists have to produce research in interesting ways, but why the Cold War when you could be doing something contemporary? So maybe we can do a quick answer for why the Cold War, if you can, if there was one point in, that inspired you to look at the Cold War. If not, um, we can also take this question off after the panel. Was there a specific moment that inspired you to look specifically at the Cold War? <laughs> okay, it's a very big question. We'll, 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 I hope you don't mind, we'll take this offline, but I think um, if the panel, uh, Kaichun, if you want to if feel like, if you have a quick answer. Um, yeah, uh, yesterday my friend asked me at the booth uh, if they, um, like, uh, the viewers, the audience, try to extract um, the elements of um, about history and also about the society, like what will be left in my work, because my work is m more like archival or historical based. Um, I would say I'm rather focused on the affective fallout, like how people they can be seen, no matter in history or at now, like because I. I believe like more, more or less you know what is happening in Hong Kong right now. And um, what I'm trying to do is not about looking back to the history, but also how to look into the trajectory and also people existed, existed in the history and also exist now. They faced a situation that they cannot be expressed by themselves. And I'm not saying like, it, and also engage at an issue of representation, but at the same time, through collaborating with my, like no matter the interviewees or the people that I work together, I try to find a middle way that they find their own agency. Yeah, that, uh, I, that is my answer to the second question. Yeah, thank you. Um. Uh, th uh, what I wanted to try to say, uh, for historical research of ours, I would rather, it's not, it's more geneal genealogical, it's not historical. So, we, exa we, ex we constitute in historical and artistic ways. It's, it's not how history happened really. It is a very contemporary thing. It is not a historical thing. So return, returning to the first question, it is difficult to distinguish today because nation states, uh, it's not a, some, a concept that has been around since, the, since day one. It started only 17th or 18th century. So from a human individual point of view, we, we can, and in a more open way, uh, ex express what we have experienced. Or, in other words, when I express what the uh, you know issues of former Soviet issues, does it really exclusively belong to Russia or to China? In a highly integrated uh, era, a lot of the things every single artist or every individual they have to have their own their own way and their own value system to distinguish to 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 distinguish their own perspective so for a lot of cultures you res you you start with respect when you observe it i think that's the most crucial thing for uh, the three of us the mo a lot of the research is either from like uh, resources that are analog that are hard to get uh, hold of uh, that are, will be forgotten and, and disappeared uh, in this d day of uh, overflowing of information and and, 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 and and data I think there is value in in, in, in digging uh, part of this digging also involves uh, on uh, on actual movement travel uh, actual um, first-hand research and collecting of of narratives and I think by this movement you do engender a kind of a uh, 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 a wider, a wider perspective at, at looking back at your own uh, research. Thanks, Ming, and thank you all three of you. We are out of time, and I think actually you find the answer to the first and second question actually in the deep and nuanced answers that we have 
Um, I think part of it, and if I may echo across the three that comes about, is how much art, um, art as a space and as a process can create spaces of empathy, of, hi of historical consciousness, I won't say necessarily big history writing, that allows us to speak beyond the divides, right? That bring back the refrain of that the old Cold War is coming back as a new Cold War and asking us to think about what kind of international world that holds multiple subjectivities and therefore multiple inheritances and multiple histories. Um, and I just want to applaud the three of you for the depth of your practices, but also the very important contribution that your works do in this regard for, I would say, our international world order today. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you um, to our artists.